background is I'm a journalist. I've spent most of my career in Canberra uh, writing about uh, things from um, government reports and various publications from the Bureau of Statistics and the like, and you feel you know what's going on in the nation. Um, but uh, it's really important to get out there and see what things are, what's happening on the ground. And so when I wrote this book, Too Much Luck, it was really about um, the idea that uh, the way governments mismanage um, our mineral wealth um, and, the, and the harmful sort of um, economic effects on, on the economy as a whole that you get from uh, a mining boom. And that by having this um, really rapid amount of development that uh, drives up costs, you've seen this in your local areas, I'm sure, around the areas affected by coal seam gas, that, um, that you can actually have a lot of um, um, job loss as, as well, whereas the government and the coal seam gas companies and the mining companies talk about all the jobs they, they generate. So it was really those ideas of the two-speed economy. But what I realised when I came to Toowoomba in November was that I was really missing uh, the impact on the ground and as mines um, and, and these gas developments um, impact people. And what I really sensed was that people were living with this, this impact um, um, you know, 24-7, and, and uh, this is something that, I, a story I really needed to tell. And so that's why I decided to, so I actually rang my publisher, and I said, I've just come back from the Darling Downs. I really think we need to do an update of Too Much Luck, because we haven't got enough of the social impact. So we've had this three-fold increase in prices. Um, minerals to exports, mining used to be about one-third of our economy, um, and now it's actually more than doubled sorry, one third of our exports are now more than doubled uh, to about 70%. And so as farmers, you will have seen the impact this has had, that you're not getting those sky high prices for your produce. Um, but um, but, but, uh, but and that, as a result of the high dollar, it means that your earnings are, are being hit as well. And this is this, this graph from the Reserve Bank that just shows what's been driving this as price impact. Um, so far we've seen some increase in what's called the volume, that's the actual sort of each truckload that's produced, but really it's been the earnings that have been going through the roof and this is what's been attracting the mining companies to do more and more investment because uh, they're, they're, they're discovering that from a sort of a gentle increase in their production, they're getting quite strong increases in their, in their earnings. Now this is, um, this is thermal coal. Um, some of it uh, comes from Queensland, most actually I think mean, from New South Wales. And again, you've seen this, um, this quite sort of dramatic increase, four times increase in earnings from five to twenty billion dollars from, from a, a um, fairly slight uh, expansion of about a third. Uh, coke and coal has been even more dramatic. Most of that, as you know, is sourced um, from mines in, in Queensland. Um, so you really have seen these quite dramatic in increases um, in the earnings up to, a, up to around the $30 billion mark. Predicted in this financial year to, to come off a bit, but as I, I'll explain later, we are going to see an, a, an increase. Um, and this is, this is LNG, which initially is coming from uh, the northwest uh, shelf over in WA, but what we're going to see in the future as these projects uh, get built here in Queensland is, is a um, coal seam gas here will start to play a, a, much, a much bigger role. Now some of the terms you might have heard in the media, uh, sometimes people talk about the two-speed economy um, or the resource curse or Dutch disease. And this is a really quite striking graph. And what it shows is that from the mid-80s um, onwards, and um, if I can get this uh, actually to work, um, that we had a, a, a quite, the top line is our non-mining exports. And that includes, of course, all of the high-value agriculture, <coughs> but also all these new industries that we developed, uh, pharmaceuticals, export and manufacturing, and that increased quite dramatically um, to about 15% of GDP. But what's happened is the mining boom, which is the dark line, has taken off, is that you've got um, the mining boom squeezing out the non-mining the non exports. So this is really making our economy uh, much more dependent on minerals. Uh, which are very volatile uh, in their prices. And this makes, I think, Australia, Australia's economy a, a more volatile um, economic proposition, in a sense. So I don't see this 
dramatic shift to be such a good thing, even though a lot of our economic advisors in Canberra uh, think it's fantastic and the Reserve Bank and others, they think this so-called structural change is a wonderful thing. But basically what it does is it makes our economy riskier because now seven out of ten dollars that we earn for our export income are coming out of minerals. Just to talk a bit about this investment phase, so we've had this big price increase and this has pushed all this investment. Uh, this is the, the, the biggest amount of investment we've ever seen in our nation's history. It's now about 9% of GDP. You'll see the blue line, uh, the, blue, the blue section, um, that's for the energy, which is pretty much gas. And that's um, around $200 billion of investment. These are projects that have been approved by company boards being built right now um, around Australia and about 70 billion of that is going into coal seam gas and we could see uh, a lot more. So this is a really significant amount of investment. Um, I think a lot of it is uh, quite risky. We have seen some pullback of late but um, it's, it's, it's pretty significant that this is the, the scale of development that we, are, that we are seeing and this is a graph showing the amount of investment as it compares to previous mining booms. Now. Why, what are the factors behind all this investment? Well, one of them is price, but the other key factor I think and we really need to get our heads around is tax. And that is part of the reason why we've had this tsunami of investment and why it's impacting on areas like the Darling Downs is because our tax rates are actually lower than those of some developing countries that are major producers. For example, Indonesia produces about 300 um, million tonnes of coal a year, that's the same as Australia. And you can see the blue line is with the um, mineral resource rent tax at 20%. It actually ended up at 22.5, but it's pretty close. Um, and this is a document released by the Treasury that uh, are the Freedom of Information. So what it's showing is that our tax rates are actually lower than those of other major producers in coal and iron ore. And this is part of what I think is actually driving um, all, of this in, all of this investment. Um, and, but also I think there's also a regulatory side as well. So there's three factors. There's price, there's tax, and it's the fact that the governments are licensing these projects. State governments collect royalties and I argue that they're pretty much addicted to these royalties because every time they um, license a project, they get a direct revenue hit. They'll get an 8% or even a 12% cut of, of the earnings. And that is what is driving these approvals because state governments are cash strapped, they're in debt. Um, even though the royalties that they're levying are actually not very effective in terms of raising money. Um, we have this, um, this drive to keep licensing projects because the states just keep wanting to get their cut. Um, there is now, I think, what, what I call a, a regulatory bias, that governments are always, their, their default position is to approve. Um, and that is because of, of that revenue hit. Um, we've seen 20,000 coal seam gas wells approved in Queensland. And um, we've seen communities wiped out nearby in, in Ackland, but also in New South Wales, places like Camberwell um, and Bulga, and obviously prime farmland habitat um, as well. So really, um, this is the coal seam gas wells um, that, are, that have already been approved. This is only the 5,000 in Queensland, a few hundred in New South Wales. This is Musselbrook and um, Singleton in the Hunter Valley, where you've got about 30 mines operating. This is what happens when you get this open slather approach uh, driven by these royalties and driven by the low tax. So this is, this is um, showing close up in the middle there is Camberwell which used to be a, um, a, a village of a few hundred people that's now completely um, surrounded and um, by mining. Um, just want to sort of finish up, actually a few issues here about the ownership of, um, of all of this investment, that increasingly mining and energy is foreign owned. Uh, it's now about 80%, which is um, about double what it is of other sectors of the economy, for example, banks. Um, the mining companies though are ploughing back their money. 80% of what they're earning in Australia, they're putting back in. And why is that? Because we're a fantastically profitable and easy place to do business. Uh, uh, low taxes, easy regulation, not very much in the way of oversight. Um, and um, this is why if you look at the blue line there compared to the pink, that's the pink line showing our overall foreign investment inflows. The blue line is the, um, 
is the foreign investment. So it's about half, even though mining's around 10% of our economy, it's half of all foreign investment inflows. So this sector is really being dominated by, um, by this investment. Just to finish off with talking about where this is going in terms of the, the volume increase, we're looking at possibly, a, if these plans go ahead, um, that uh, are on the drawing board or are being, being built, we're looking at a, a doubling of coal and iron ore, a four times increase in, in LNG. Um, really what this is going to mean also is that even if prices come off, these high volumes will hold up our earnings and hold up the Australian dollar. So we are going to continue to see that structural change in the economy with the non-mining economy really starting to dominate. Um, this is a graph from A there showing a four times increase in LNG production over the next um, 10 to 15 years and even more dramatic in terms of exports. This will also mean that we pay more for gas because the gas is all going to be going offshore where, where prices are higher. Um, oh, just an interesting point about Qatar, if you look at where we're going with all this, Australia is, wants to become the top exporter of LNG. Uh, in the world, even though our reserves are only ranked 13th. So we're trying to really punch above our weight, uh, which I don't think is really in our national interest to do so. Um, and uh, when you look at Qatar, this came from a recent government report that I looked at, talking about how they've put a moratorium on new developments, because they're worried about developing too quickly, even though they've got 284 years of production compared to us at 58. This is for conventional gas. Um, so Qatar is you know, really taking a strong national interest approach, which I, I think our government should be looking at doing, um, and uh, they put a moratorium. So this is a really sharp contrast, I think, between the difference in the mentality. Our governments are just going all out to develop as fast as possible with low taxes, loose regulation, and, um, and whereas the Qatari government and others around the world are being much more uh, cautious about this. Just want to finish off, because I know time is tight, um, in terms of the sort of governance reform, and this is really what I talk about in Minefield, that really the system we have is, is, is pathetic. It really is a joke that, that the companies just do their own EISs. You can get anyone to write your report. You can get your grandmother to do it if you want, and the government will accept it. We do not accredit environmental consultants in the way that ASIC accredits financial, financial advisors. And I think this is the sort of reform that we need. I argue that, that this current system we have is really flawed because it's inside government departments. If you compare it to the way we regulate the monetary system, the banking system and, and companies, that uh, regulation of the resource sector is, is really very backward. It's a sort of a colonial model. So I actually argue that we should be putting uh, a lot more effort into building up strong institutions, independent statutory institutions, actually like we've done for offshore oil and gas. Uh, we set up a new institution there called Nopsema after the Montara oil spill. And this is the sort of thing we need. I think we need some of the much stronger taxation. We had stronger taxation of our resources, really recognising the fact that these resources are finite. We wouldn't have the tsunami of investment. We'd have more moderate um, and sensible um, investment. I've also talked before about savings policy. Um, and finally, to really talk about regional land use, coming back to the heart of what this presentation is about today, and that is we really need to get the politicians to understand that the Chinese may not always want our coal because they are changing their, their energy supply, they're moving out of that into renewables, and, um, but they will always be wanting to eat and they'll be wanting to eat the high quality food that we produce, particularly protein, as, they, as their middle class grows. So we really do need, I think, to adopt a national interest approach to supporting food production and really seeing it as being a core part of our national interest rather than sort of going all out to become a quarry and a gas field. So I'll leave it that. Thank you. Um, a common misconception about Lock the Gate is that we're absolutely opposed to mining of all kinds, of all sorts, anywhere and everywhere, and that's not the case. Officially our policy is that um, we're opposed to inappropriate mining. Mining is okay, provided certain things are protected, and there are some things that are just too precious 
and about which there should be no if, buts or maybes. Um, so those things are good farming land, our water resources, places that are environmentally sensitive and which provide critical environmental services, so things like wetlands, um, estuaries like Gladstone Harbour, uh, the health of people in nearby communities and our cultural heritage assets. And um, we'll probably come back to some of those a bit later. So um, Frank asked me to talk particularly about the impacts on um, food production and the Darling Downs. This is quite old mapping. Um, and this is the Queensland part of the Murray-Darling Basin and it shows what was considered to be good agricultural land. I want to acknowledge Queensland Murray-Darling Committee. I'm a director, I sit on the board of QNDC and I particularly want to mention Roxanne Blackley who is our GIS whiz and created most of the maps that um, I'm going to show you today. There's quite a few maps in this little presentation. So this, this information of um, uh, the Queensland part of Murray-Darling Basin's um, good agricultural land has been around for a long time. Much more recently, we've, um, the state government, the Labor government, de developed a policy about protecting strategic cropping land. And QNDC played quite an important role in getting that happening. Unfortunately, uh, I'll go back a step. When, when we started talking about it as a board, we, we talked about defining it in, in naturally, ecologically defined terms. And um, Roxanne and others did the mapping and so on, and there was much consultation with the experts in Department of Invo uh, Natural Resources and Environment, um, who thought that the criteria and the methodology were very logical and perfectly defensible and so on. And eventually, this made its way up to the cabinet process where the politicians tore it all apart and put in some very dodgy, to me, sounding criteria. And when you look at the strategic cropping land policy now and the gateway process that's been put in place, no never comes into it. It's always yes with conditions. As you can see, what's defined as strategic cropping land is quite a small subset of what was previously considered to be Queensland, uh, southwest Queensland's good agricultural quality land. Now, I've only lived on the Downs some um, 25 years or so, but before I came here, I was well aware that the Darling Downs was famous worldwide for the quality of its soils. And there was an old adage about um, the Darling Downs occupies about 4% of Queensland's surface area, but it produces about 25% of Queensland's agricultural output. And as far as I know, those figures are still roughly the case. When you look at a picture like this of the Darling Downs, it becomes very obvious that this is a place where precision farming is undertaken. Our farmers are incredibly efficient, they're very high tech, they're very comfortable with the technology, they've spent zillions of dollars um, making the best use of every drop of water, of using satellite navigation so that they're only driving over the same strips of country and not squashing, compressing soils in other parts. Um, and it's a, a, a real testament to their um, ingenuity and commitment that they've been able to maintain levels of production even under very difficult drought conditions with um, over allocation in the Murray-Darling Basin and with all kinds of new regulations and so on that various governments have brought in. When you picture that previous slide and try and superimpose that on top of it, you can see that the arguments that the coal seam gas industry makes that Precision agriculture, intensive agriculture, and coal seam gas development can coexist is a nonsense. There is no way that you can put those kind of roads on our floodplains, make them, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, they're not, they're not all weather access, making them, making them you know, accessible even under floods. So they, they've got to be raised six, eight, however many inches they do it. They're probably, I don't know, six metres wide. Um, that's going to interrupt our very efficient flood irrigation systems. There's no way you can drive a tractor and a cotton header over all that when it's covered also in pipes and lines and electricity overhead lines and, and so on and so on and so on. It's just a nonsense to suggest that these things can happily coexist and that there won't be any impact on food and fibre production. Um, for those of you that are interested in maps, you might like to take a note of that um, web link. This is the government's um, interactive resource tenure mapping system. You can find it online. Um, 
it's not that easy to, uh, not, not that difficult to use if you download the user guide which is in the help menu and just read through it and have a play with it for a while. If a clucks like me can do it without having my geeky kids to show me how to drive it, anybody can do it. And this shows the extent of um, exploration permits for coal seam gas over the Queensland part of the Murray-Darling Basin. Uh, this is actually a 2008 image, I think, and I should point out that this little bit over here, um, Arrow Energy chose not to renew its lease on P EPP 791, which stretches from the outskirts of Warwick over the Great Dividing Range and almost to Bow Desert. Um, so that little, that little piece is not actually subject to, um, to an exploration permit anymore, uh, which is a bit of a win. Um, but as you can see, a huge chunk of the Queensland part of the Murray-Darling Basin most certainly is. That's what you get when you overlay that exploration permit mapping with our good quality agricultural land. And you can see how much of it is vulnerable to a, another land use. Sarah, could you just point out a few of the main lands? Place names? Place names? Yeah. Okay, so we've got Cunnamulla and Charleville way out here in the southwest. Here's Warwick, Toowoomba, Dolby, Gundawindi down here on the border rivers, Mooney. Miles, and the really intense part that everybody should be deeply concerned about is this arc that comes through here, takes in pretty much the entire Upper Condamine floodplain, some of the best farming land in the world. This is pretty much the same uh, layer of um, exploration permits, but superimposed on the strategic cropping lands rather than the good quality agricultural land. And you can see the, um, this, this line across the corner here is the easement that's been um, set aside for a major pipeline to take all this gas when it's um, produced up to um, Gladstone. Um, it's quite a wide corridor and there's a whole lot of negotiation that will have to go on to refine that and actually define the, um, the pipeline path. Uh, but if you, if you go in and create maps on this system, you can look at the whole of Queensland and there's a, a veritable bowl of spaghetti of pipelines running every which way, um, many of them converging on Gladstone. Of course, it's not just um, exploration, and unfortunately I'm, uh, in here under these lighting conditions, it's not that clear, but you can see uh, the yellow is some um, individual wells, and they're so close together that they just become a big blur. The purple areas are the areas that are well and truly beyond exploration now and uh, in the production phases. And um, this area here, south of Roma, around Roma, we and Billa is, um, has become a kind of a hub where all the pipelines are coming together. Um, so all the individual projects feed their, their gas into bigger and bigger pipelines, and it all gathers, collects at um, William Bella, and then a major pipeline will be running up to Gladstone from there. <coughs> and the, the lines coming in from the west, the almost horizontal lines, are actually existing um, gas lines that take uh, gas from the Aramanga gas fields down to Brisbane and stop by the um, Oakey Power Station, I believe. So there's a range of risks involved in coal seam gas. Um, we've heard a fair bit on the radio during um, the Senate inquiry and so on about the amount of salt that might be involved. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go through all these, but when you, when you look at them and understand that none of these risks have been accurately quantified um, and even less rigorously assessed, you start to realise that there's a quantum of risks that governments and companies are prepared to inflict on us um, without really understanding what the implications might be in the long term. And, you know, with, with some of these things, particularly with contamination of aquifers, we really don't know if when stuff hits the fan, there's any going back from there, which is a very scary thought. I mean, look, we are the driest inhabited continent. One would like to think that after 10 years, the worst drought in living memory, we would have some um, desire to ab absolutely state categorically no questions our water supplies are absolutely sacrosanct and yet they're not. <coughs> so that's enough about coal seam gas for a moment. Um, moving on to coal. Um, and I look at my prompt. Um, so the, the impacts on, on land when we come to open cut coal mines are arguably um, more confined. Um, hotter hot spots, if you like. Um, I guess if you're sitting um, 
as a landholder in an area where a coal mine is likely to be dug on top of you, the best that can be said is that you will be bought out and you will have to, and you'll be compensated to some extent and you can go somewhere else. If you happen to live nearby and you're not in the footprint of the mine, then things might be very different. Whereas if you are somebody that's going to have a coal seam gas development on your land, it's very unlikely that they're going to buy you out. They own the, the, um, the mineral rights under the ground and they will, you will be forced to coexist with them. Um, so you, the, the opportunities to be appropriately compensated and to go somewhere else are um, considerably less. And the big question is where would you go? If you actually go in and look at a map of Queensland and where all the mining and all the coal seam gas exploration permits are, there's not much of Queensland that's not subject to one or the other. Uh, so this is, um, this is an image of New Hope Coal. You can see that um, at a landscape scale, the, uh, the impacts are fairly big. If you happen to be an endangered species living in there, you're probably not going to be there very long and there'll be an offset somewhere which um, for an organisation like QNDC is um, pretty serious stuff when we've got targets in our natural resource management plan to increase native vegetation cover and ensure that endangered species particularly have got somewhere to live and when they're allowed to do offsets with um, completely different vegetation types that doesn't work terribly well. Um, I know that um, uh, this is an issue that's of huge concern to the people out at Oki if the uh, expansion of New Hope coal mine were to go ahead, um, this kind of um, fume event, um, apparently this is a, a, a nitrous oxide cloud that um, can happen if um, blasting, if the uh, ammonium nitrate, I believe, the substance they use for blasting um, has been wet. Um, it can create these toxic clouds. That stuff can, can travel for 10 or 15 kilometres um, and it can suffocate people. And in 2011, more than 62 mine workers were hospitalised after being exposed to these kind of events. So if you live, you know, 10, 10 kilometres is a fairly serious buffer, um, but if you live 10 to 15 kilometres away from um, a coal mine where this sort of um, industrial type activity is going on, or if indeed you work there, there's a, a fairly serious risk to your health. Um, of course it's not just coal um, and there are mineral development licences for um, various things on the Darling Downs. Um, I've, I've used this, this is um, just a couple of slides about the Lady Annie mine which is up near Mount Isa because um, whilst the mining industry is very quick to say we have a very small footprint, you know, we're about 1% of, you know, we, we have a 1% impact on land use whereas agriculture, you know, has very diffuse impacts across the landscape and it's, you know, in area terms much greater, um, the, the long-term effects of um, uh, accidents at mining um, developments can be quite far-reaching. Uh, in 2008 or 9, there was a spill at Lady Annie. This is an image of um, their um, waste rock dump. I tried to find, um, and couldn't, I didn't have a lot of time this afternoon, a picture of very famous images of the floods in central Queensland a few years ago. You remember the big hole in the ground and the huge drag line and the crane sitting in it and all that. And that, that water with that silt load in it went all the way to the Great Barrier Reef. And it really only became a major concern for anybody in government when um, town drinking water supplies were impacted. And it was very serious for people in Rockhampton undergoing dialysis treatment because there was just no water that they could use. It was, it was so dangerous to uh, be drinking it, let alone um, using it for uh, dialysis treatment. This was part of the aftermath of Lady Annie. Lady Annie's a copper mine, um, and they had a, uh, a spill that resulted in some 50 kilometres of creeks downstream, turning this startling bright blue colour. Um, the... Uh, the sampling results confirmed that aluminium levels were 100 times the safe levels, cobalt 500 times the safe levels, copper 600 times the safe levels, nickel 200 times the safe levels, and the pH of 209, which is so far off the scale I can't, I can't begin to imagine what that does. Suffice to say you wouldn't want to get anywhere near it. And it was an absolute disaster for graziers in that part of the world. Um, that apparently the mining company was given six months to, um, to fence off the stream to keep stock away from it, but six months later nothing had been happened and um, a lot of farmers had to actually destroy their stock 
um, because they were contaminated after, well, amazing that they'd survived after drinking that nice little brew. Um, but certainly um, contamination levels way off the scale and, and not saleable. Uh, this is um, the coal exploration permits across the uh, Queensland part of the Murray-Darling Basin. And again, you can see um, incredible interest in the um, Condamine floodplain. It would just be an absolute disaster if we were to sacrifice 25% of Queensland's agricultural production for, um, which, which, you know, if, if farmers look after it, and I know farmers do look after their, they invest in their soil resources very carefully, whereas coal is a one-off, dig a big hole, it's gone. And as far as I'm aware, nowhere in the world has rehabilitation of farming land, certainly nothing of this quality. I mean, those soils out there are just like the most delicious chocolate cake. Never been done. It cannot be done. And even if you go to, out to New Hope and have a look at some of the stage one that has been rehabilitated, it grows very ordinary grass and pretty ordinary trees. So I think that, you know, in terms of even beef production, it's, it's never going to come back to anything like what might have been there beforehand. Um, that's the impact of um, the coal permits on good agricultural land across the whole of um, the Queensland Murray-Darling Basin. Back to lock the gate. So that's our mission. You can read it yourself. Um, as I said, we um, have a bee in our bonnet about responsible mining and protecting those things upon which life depends and which are important to us culturally. We think that those are pretty reasonable principles on which to base a mining policy. Um, in many cases, the, uh, the sorts of projects that we're hearing about, and I, I was outside but heard, heard Paul mentioning the laughable nature of EIS processes and the kind of information that, um, the kind of assessments that are actually done. Um, I thought we were a clever country, but sometimes you just have to shake your head and wonder. Um, I ran you through, ran through these, the, um, the no if, buts and maybes, the things that Lock the Gate as an organisation is committed to protecting. We're not anti-mining, provided all those things are, are met. Um, I just wanted to talk briefly about the strategy. Um, the term Lock the Gate was actually coined by a, um, a, a group of farmers at a meeting out at Warra a couple of years ago. Um, Drew Hutton proposed shut the gate. And the farmer said, well, we always shut the gate, you know, that's no big deal. <laughs> if the gate's shut, you shut it. If the gate's open, you can leave it open. Locking the gate, now there's a statement. Um, and so it's become the name of the campaign, it's become the strategy. The strategy being focused around non-cooperation. Um, it's about saying, no, you're not welcome here, I'm not going to talk to you, I'm not going to let you onto my farm. Those people who do choose to negotiate, and, and some have, um, for whatever reason, um, our advice to them is um, never invite them onto your place, always negotiate on neutral territory, record everything that is said and done, preferably on video, never be there alone. Um, and I guess if you're going to go down that path, my strategy, I wouldn't go there, but if I did, um, it would be to delay and obstruct and to waste as much of their time and cost them as much money as possible. Um, so, the strategy is focused around non-cooperation. <coughs> it's also about non-violent direct action, and that can involve everything from um, any kind of media stunt that you want to pull, but when it comes to the crunch, when, when um, companies are trying to force their way onto your property against your will, um, it's about blockading, it's about locking yourself on to fences, to drilling rigs, to machinery, to whatever it takes, again, to delay and obstruct them as much as you possibly can. Um, I think I'll leave it there. Thank you for, oh, no, I won't, no, I won't. There's one other thing that I wanted to add. Um, lock, lock the gate is not a means to, its end, to, a means to an end. For some people, I think that it is, that, you know, as long as I can stop this coming onto my farm, then I'll have won and I'll feel good about it. For, for others involved in the movement, um, Lock the Gate is a vehicle. It, what we're trying to do is to build a social movement. And Lock the Gate is the vehicle that will take us to a place, a place in time where there is so much political pressure that we will be able to force governments to make the changes that we want, protection of good land, water, all those things, 
and, in, and, and a, a social environment in which those changes will become politically possible. So that's the reason that we're doing it and it would be great if you could all be part of it too. Thank you.